Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1C for September 1st. And uh, the next topic we have is uh, conductors and insulators. We just talked about electric charges. We discussed how electric charges basically arise from having either extra electrons or missing electrons. And the total charge on an object is always a whole number of electrons. Um, and one thing that I, I failed to mention in this process right here is that uh, there is something called conservation of charge that's gonna be pretty relevant. Uh, we will use this idea many times in this class. But because of the fact that um, charges come from electrons, uh, electric charge is a conserved quantity, just like other conserved quantities that we've learned about in physics. What are some examples, some other conserved quantities? Do you, do you all remember from, from physics 1A? What are some other things that are conserved in physics? Yeah, we've got energy. What are the other things? Conserved. Conserved quantities. Um, energy, momentum, if you guys get them all. And angular momentum, right? Now, mass, yeah, mass, but at the same time, mass isn't really conserved, right? Because um, we have this equation. We have, maybe you haven't learned it at this point, but you've all heard it before. E equals mc squared. You can convert mass into energy, right? So, um, but yeah, I think in chemistry it's true, right? That mass is conserved in almost all of the chemical processes. Yeah, in all chemical processes, mass is conserved, right? This is being put up on YouTube, so if that's wrong, it'll sound really stupid, but I'm pretty sure that's true. In physics, we talk about energy, momentum, angular momentum, and now one new one, conservation of charge. Why is charge conserved? Well, it's conserved because electrons are conserved. You can't really lose electrons, so um, if you can't lose electrons, then charge has to be conserved, pretty much, right? This is a conservation law that is always true. There is no time in which you can create or destroy charges. You just have a fixed amount of charges. And that fixed amount of charges would just be how many ever electrons you've got. Electrons can't decay, so uh, charge has to be conserved. So, um, okay, so we'll need to use that from time to time, charge conservation. Okay, so... Um, yeah, conductors and insulators. Okay, so a conductor. What's an example of something that conducts electricity well? Copper. Copper, yep. Graphite, does graphite conduct electricity well? Maybe it does. Silver. Gold. Yeah. So, you know, metals pretty much, right? Is graphite a conductor or is it a semiconductor, Jasba? Do you know? I, I want to say graphite's a semiconductor, which is kind of in between these two objects. Okay, metals. It's usually metals that are conductors of electricity, right? Everything can conduct electricity up to a point, and in a few, probably in about a month or so, it says graphite's a conductor. Okay. I guess we can put graphite in here, too. I mean... I don't know if I'm going to write it down here, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, copper, silver, gold, um, basically metals is mostly what I think about when I think about conductors. Conductors tend to be the type of thing that we make wires out of to transmit electricity. And they have a, uh, a unique uh, property that makes them conductors, okay? Um, inside of a conductor, like metals, um, electrons tend to, some of the electrons, we'll just say outer shell electrons, and if you haven't taken chemistry, the idea is that electrons are in little shells around atoms, and the ones on the very, very far outside are sometimes free enough that they can be rubbed off. The outer shell electrons are weakly bound. And what can happen as a result of them being weakly bound is they can move all over the object, okay? So if we take a metal bar and we imagine that this metal, this is gonna be a very simplistic explanation, but let me see. 
imagine that this metal bar is made of nuclei. So these are going to represent nuclei here. Each of these positive things that I'm writing, these are nuclei, okay? The nuclei is guaranteed to be positively charged, right? Because, well, it has a lot of protons and a lot of neutrons inside of it. But let's include within these nuclei the atoms themselves minus the outer shell electrons, okay? And now on the same picture, what I'm gonna put in here are some electrons. I'm just gonna use a little dot to represent an electron, okay? Just so that it's clear. These electrons are, they're all over the place inside of here. And the way that this works is that uh, these electrons are, they're weakly bound, okay? And that means that they're free to move around. How free are they to move around? Well, they can move around just like a river can flow, basically, right? You know, if you, if you have a river, it flows in a certain direction, you have this flow of water. Electrons can flow around inside of here, just like in a river, okay? They can, they can zip all over the place, okay? You know, sometimes they come along and they hit an atom, and that might cause their, their, their trajectory to deflect, and they might fly up like this or something like this. But for the most part, these electrons can move around. Uh, it's almost like it's like, a, it's like a sea of electrons, or an ocean or a lake or whatever you want to think about, a, a tub full of water that's electrons. They, they act like a fluid, okay? They act kind of like a fluid. And the fact that you have these free electrons that can move all over the place allows these conductors to be good conductors of electricity, okay? And that means they can conduct current, which we'll learn about in a few weeks. But it also means that um, it's, it's hard to, uh, to charge a conductor. You'll notice when you go back here, these pictures that we had when we were talking about plastic and glass, those are not good conductors of electricity, right? Those are gonna fall in the class of insulators, okay? So let's talk about insulators real quick. And then we'll then we'll compare the two of them and talk about what, what it is about this sea of electrons that allows the conductor to be a good conductor. So insulators are things like what? You've got like, I don't know, give me some examples. Wood's an insulator, right? What else, what else is there? Plastic. What kind of things can you think of don't really conduct electricity very well? Rubber, yep. Stuff like this, okay? These are insulators. These are bad conductors of electricity. Thanks, Jasba, or Brian, for linking that. So I guess Jasba linked that, right? Okay, so graphite also has these valence electrons. Okay, I'll go ahead and put graphite in here since you guys have shown me that it is in fact a, a conductor. Okay, so insulators, you've got like wood, plastic, and rubber. And the main difference is just that uh, in this case, the, the electrons are strongly bound. Um, and they're not able to flow through the object. They can be rubbed off. Paper is another example of an insider, yep. So the electrons can't flow as easily. Now that doesn't mean you can't rub off electrons. You can still rub electrons off of these objects, okay? Now, what's the difference then between taking a piece of plastic, all right, so you take a piece of plastic, right? And we said earlier that you can take a piece of plastic and you can rub it enough until it gains extra electrons, right? Um, why do you think you can't do the same thing with a, with a conductor? You can rub a piece of plastic and you can make it negatively charged, right? Why, why do you think you can't do the same thing with a conductor? Because the conductors are already positively charged? No, the conductor is still neutral overall. Oh, okay. Now, I don't want you to think that it's, that it's impossible to charge a conductor. That is definitely not true. Uh, but you need to have a special setup to, to be able to do it. Patrick says, free electrons within conductors are going to repel other electrons. Interesting. So if you were to try to add extra electrons to it, you think that uh, it would repel the electrons we're trying to add? That's a good idea. I don't think that's exactly what's going on, but it's, it's a good thought. <laughs> Why can't you? I meant by rubbing, not by rubber. Sorry about that. Uh, since the electrons are a lot f or are more free to flow in metals, do you think that it, that they kind of flow back to the thing that 
is giving them for right. flow somewhere else. Yeah, that's they right. They don't hold them. That's right. That's yeah. right. So when you rub things on a plastic, what happens is that the plastic will pick up all these extra electrons, right? So you get all these extra negatively charged electrons in here that you've, that you've added to the plastic. And they kind of tend to stick where you where you put them. Okay? They don't they don't move around a lot, okay? They might vibrate, but they don't they don't move around a lot. Okay? And they they definitely don't flow back into your hand, for example. So if I for, if I came along here and I was I was holding this piece of plastic, right? So this is me and I um, so if I, if I was holding this plastic with my hand, okay, the, um, the electrons that are near my hand right here, they may be attracted to my skin somehow, and they may move through my body or something, I don't know. But the other pieces of electrons right here, they can't flow backwards, right? Okay. Now let's compare that to what happens when I, when I try to rub something onto this one right here and I touch it with my hand. Okay. So a metal, when I touch a metal with my hand, like this right here, so I'm holding the metal, right? And then let's say someone else takes a piece of fur and they rub the metal a bunch, right? So they, they, try to, they try to do something, you know, either add or subtract electrons away. And let's say that it develops a little bit of charge. What ends up happening is that if I'm standing on the ground, the let's say that you get extra electrons in this object, okay? So let's say that we dump just a whole bunch of extra electrons onto this object, right? By some process. Well, those electrons that I dump in this end over here, they're not gonna stay there. Because if I get a bunch of negatively charged electrons on the left-hand side right here, what's that gonna do to all the other electrons inside of here? You see what I mean? Like, so if I, if I even, if, even if I were to bring something that was really negatively charged next to this object, if I bring a, a heavily negatively charged object up to the next to this, what's gonna happen is that all these electrons in here are gonna feel a force and it's gonna push them down to the end. That's exactly right, Angie, that will push them down to the end. And then, any extra electrons that are here are actually going to flow through my body and then back into the ground. So the Earth is actually a provider and a receiver of electrons, and it can provide and receive pretty much an unli unlimited amount of electrons. So pretty much, if you try to charge the object, if you don't insulate it from the ground, then any extra charges that you build up on the object are going to flow through your body and directly into the ground. Does that make sense? So that's why they put wires inside the rubber because the rubber isn't insulated and it's safer to touch. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you coat the wire in rubber, you can have electricity flowing through it and it won't, it won't hurt you. That being said, if the electricity flows fast enough, it can burn the insulator. So it's not completely safe. Yeah. Anyway, so conductors have weakly bound electrons that are free to flow around. Insulators have the inability, they, they don't allow electrons to flow easily, okay? Okay, so that's the, the difference between conductors and insulators that's going to be relevant for us for this class, is when we think about conductors, and this will be very important as we, as we go through this class, we'll, we'll be talking about the effect of charging conductors and charging insulators and all of these things. So it's not that it's impossible to charge a conductor, you can charge a conductor, but in order to do so, you need an insulator to prevent the electrons from escaping back into the ground. That's the, that's the main thing to say, all right? Why is it that sometimes electricity flow throughout a body without a problem and some electrocute us? It's dependent upon how, uh, what's called the, the size of the current that's flowing through your body, Haiti. It's dependent on the size of the current. And the flow of current through your body depends on your electrical resistance, okay? So I'm, I'm introducing two terms that we will later define. But the basic, the basic idea is this. Suppose that someone applies some voltage to you. The voltage is basically just something that creates like a, a lane that electrons can pass through. If your resistance is really, really high, then you're not going to get electrocuted. That means if your body is dry and, you know, yeah. Now, if your body is wet, your resistance is going to be low. And then when you apply the voltage, you're going to feel a large current. And that's what causes damage to your body. Doesn't it depend if you're grounded or not? It does depend if you're grounded or not. That's right, Justin. Is it possible to charge a conductor with a magnetic field around it? Oh, huh? maybe. I would. Now, are you asking is it possible to charge a conductor when there is a magnetic field around it, or are you asking if it's possible? Like, can I? Or are you asking if it's possible to charge a conductor by using a magnetic field? Which one are you asking? Is that distinction clear? Both. I'm sure you can charge a conductor when there's a magnetic field around it. I don't see any reason why you couldn't be able to. 
you shouldn't be able to charge a conductor with a magnetic field, no. You can, however, turn a conductor into a magnet by using a magnetic field. Maybe, Haiti. That could be true. Yeah, sometimes when people get tased, they might be more affected if they have higher or lower resistance. It's possible. I don't really know. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I, I really think it's more likely that we all have pretty much the same resistance and that that resistance really only changes based on um, how wet we are, but it's conceivable that, you know, depending on body shape and body size, that our resistances might be different. But, okay. All right, so again, the main thing you need to remember that's going to be important for us in this class is that when you think of a conductor in 1C, you should think that you have this sea of electrons that are free to move around, okay? Not all the electrons, just some of them are free to move around. And when you think about an insulator, the charges are not free to move around. That's pretty much all you need to know about the difference between these two things in terms of, of one physics 1C. One other thing, I don't know if this matters, uh, all these things, now I don't know about graphite, but definitely copper, silver, and gold are good conductors of heat too. Would you all agree? The metals tend to be good conductors of heat. Do you know the reason why they're good conductors of heat and good conductors of electricity? It's because the heat is actually carried by the electrons. It's because of the electrons. That's right, Kavi. So the electrons flow easily. That means that if you get the electrons in one end of this thing hot, those electrons can zip their way back up to the other end. And then, you know, you take a piece of metal, put it in a, put it in a fire for a long period of time. Eventually, your, your hand's going to get really hot because the, the, the electrons in the metal are actually going to flow. They're going to get warm and they're going to flow up to the end of the rod. So it's the same reason. The electrons are carrying the heat as well as carrying the electricity, or carrying the temperature, I guess is a better way to say it. Okay, so we talked about conductors and insulators. We can now get into Coulomb's Law and start talking about some of the, the real physics that describes how uh, charges interact with each other. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to talk about Coulomb's law, and Coulomb's law is used to describe electric forces. So when you think of Coulomb's law, it is used for one and only one thing, and that is to find electric forces between objects. This is the way that we quantify exactly how large a force can be between two different objects. So I'm going to describe this uh, as simply as I can. So does wood burn easily because the electrons stay where they are? I don't think wood burning easily has to do with electrons. It probably has more to do with um, some chemical reason why the wood is able to, uh, you know, ignite and, and burn. I think that's a chemistry question as to why wood burns easily. That's what I would say. Maybe. Maybe there's a physics explanation too, but I, I think it's I think it's mostly because of I think it's a chemical explanation as to why wood burns. Because it's definitely a chemical process, right? Wood burning is a chemical process, that combustion process. Yeah. Okay, Coulomb's Law. So this is about how big of a force two objects feel. So let's say that I take a positively charged object right here. And I tell you that it has a charge. Remember, the symbol we're using for charge is Q. So I'm going to say that this object has a charge Q1, okay? Next to it, I'm going to place a negative charge. No, you know what? Let's do positive charge, because I think it's easier, well, for me, it's easier to understand when I have two positively charged objects. I take a positively charged object Q1, I place it near a positively charged object Q2. We place these two objects near each other, and now we're going to imagine that these are the only two things that exist in the universe, just these two things. We're not going to worry about other forces. We're not going to worry about gravity friction, we're not going to worry about normal forces, just these two objects exist. They're out in the middle of nowhere, middle of empty space. We have a positive charge here and a positive charge here. We know that there is a force that pushes them apart because we all learned that probably in grade school. And what we'd like to know is how big the force is. So in order to do that, we need to know a couple things. We need to know exactly how far apart they are because the distance between these objects is going to affect... Um, 
how big the force is. So let's define the distance between the center of mass of each of these objects to be r. That's all we need. We just need the size of this charge, the size of this charge, the distance between the objects, and then we can say that there is going to be a force that is placed on these objects. We know that this force is going to be repulsive. It's going to be um, repulsive. So each of these objects is going to feel a force. They will feel the same force, but I will say that uh, we'll just call the force that they feel F sub E. And to find that force with Coulomb's law, we'll put that up here. F E, the size of the force, is equal to a constant it's called the electric constant, sometimes written as k sub e, but usually I will just write it as just k. I'll tell you what it is in a second. Multiplied by charge 1 times charge 2, and then we divide by the distance between them squared. This is Coulomb's law. It says that the electric force force between two objects is equal to uh, this constant. I'll tell you what the constant is right now. k is equal to approximately 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared over Coulomb squared. This is a conversion factor, effectively, to take this definition of force, Q1, Q2 over R squared, and convert it into Newtons. If you check the units of these, you'll see that you're always going to get Newtons, as long as you measure Q1 in Coulombs, Q2 in Coulombs, and R in meters. So. You'll have to convert everything directly into Coulombs to make this, this work out. But that's Coulombs law. So that's the convention for K that we will use for this class? Because I know the book gave like maybe two other Yep, there's another, there's another way that you can write this. So another way you can write it is that F sub E is equal to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught. You can, you're going to use both of these, basically, is the best answer to your question. Uh, multiplied by the same thing, Q1, Q2, divided by R squared. If you compare these two equations, you'll notice that the only thing that differentiates them is the constant that's in front. In this case, we have a constant that's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. In this case, we have a constant that's k. They mean the same thing because k, the electric constant, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Kind of weird, but yeah. We don't need to set the absolute value on q1, q2 because the book did. We do. I. Alicia, I just wanted to like write the formula down and then I was gonna talk about the signs. Yeah. Right now everything's positive, right? So F E. F E stands for electric force. F sub E stands for electric force. Not iron. Alright, is this what you meant in your question? That there's different versions of the Coulomb's law? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So you need to know both of them because you'll see both of these symbols appear. Now, you could figure out what epsilon naught is yourself if you want. It's equal to, you know, 1 over 4 pi k. But I'll just tell you right now that epsilon naught is going to be equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And then we got to invert this. So it's coulombs squared over newton meter squared. This is kind of like the more old tiny version of this equation. Kavi, the other, the, the actual K, I think is 8.99. So for me, I don't care. Will the mastering physics stuff care? I, probably not. The, the fact that it's 8.99 and 9, I think it's like 8.989 actually. So it's almost 8.999. It's really close to 9, Kavi. You know what I mean? Uh, so... I don't think it's going to mess up your math if you just always use 9. But if you want to be really, really, really careful, you can use this one. Um, you know, sometimes it might matter. I, I just, I, I think it, I mean, usually when I when I do the homework, when someone comes and asks me a question about homework and I'm, I'm trying it out myself, I just use 9 and it seems like it works. You know, 99.9% .9 of the time. So there's our definition of Coulomb's law. Now, someone mentioned something, uh, Alicia mentioned something about absolute values. So if, if they're both positive, then all the numbers in this equation are positive. You don't need to worry about it, right? But you are correct that really what you want to do when you're defining this is in case you have negative charges, you don't want to put the negative sign in. So the more formal definition of this looks like this, what they do in the book. They just take the absolute value of the charges and then divide by R squared. You can use that to find the size of the electric force 
And then for the direction, you're going to have to do the direction yourself, basically. And that's the electric force. It's, um, it's an inverse square law, right? Does this look like anything you've seen before? Gravitational force. Yeah, it looks like gravity, right? Gravity is this. Gravity, the force of gravity, which is always attractive, maybe, um, is Fg is equal to big G, which is kind of like the K, mass 1, mass 2, over R squared, right? They're both what we call inverse square laws. That's because the force gets weaker and weaker the farther you get away, and it gets weaker as R squared, so that's what we call it as in inverse square law. Um, there is, of course, one other possibility right here, too. I can replace these both with negative charges, and the diagram would look exactly the same. But um, the difference comes, I guess, when you have, you know, if you have a positive charge here, and you have a negative charge right here, right? The only difference is going to be that the force between the two of them is now going to be attractive, uh, and the way you calculate it is exactly the same. Okay, um, just to get a good comfortability with this, do you guys want to try an example where you can kind of plug numbers in and see if you can get the, is that okay? All right. I could do it for you, but I think you learn more if you just do it yourself. Uh, we didn't talk about um, charging by induction, but that's fine, we'll get, that. we'll get to that later. I almost feel like we can't talk about charging by induction unless we're in class, because I need to show you the setup for it. So let's see how much of this I can keep on the screen. Let's grab this guy. Put him right here. Whoops. Well, that works. I can just move it down. And let's use this. Right here. Did anyone get confused by this second equation right here? Is that confusing anyone? A little bit? Yeah. So I want you to look at what's the same and what's different about them, okay? What's the same? It's that, right? They both contain Q1 times Q2 over R squared, right? And what's different? The difference is the symbol that's in front of them. This one has this whole messy symbol like one over four pi epsilon naught, but it turns out that that quantity is the same thing as this quantity here. It's just different ways of expressing the same thing. Now, there is one thing that's nice about this equation. The four pi r squared that shows up right here. What is four pi r squared? Area, area of what? That's right, it's an area. It's the surface area of a sphere. Exactly, Josh got it exactly right. Area, sphere, surface area of a sphere, exactly, right? Well, that's interesting. Why does that show up down here? Why does the surface area of a sphere show up here? Because real life is 3D, that's right. That's the actual answer, that's the right answer. We live in a three-dimensional universe, that's why the sphere shows up down here. And the idea is, this is gonna become more clear later on, but yeah. when we talk about electric fields, I'll, I'll go into a lot more detail as, as to why that four pi r squared is there, but you're absolutely right that the answer is because we live in a three-dimensional universe. And that means that this electricity kind of gets spread out over a sphere. When we talk about electric fields, it'll become very clear why that's there. So we have these two different equations, and it's, it's not meant to confuse you. Uh, it's just meant to give you two different ways to describe the same thing, and I think also this epsilon naught thing is more historic but it's also useful. So, okay, um, this is the problem I want to look at. I think we have all the information we need right here. So uh, this up here tells us the charge and the mass of an electron, a proton, and a neutron, some of which we will need for this problem. We won't need all of that information. But um, what we want to find is, it says the hydrogen atom. It says the electron and the proton of a hydrogen atom are separated on the average by a distance of approximately 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. 
we want to find the magnitudes of the electric force and the gravitational force between the particles. So there's two questions here. And I'm going to add a third. I also want you to find the ratio between the two of them. So part A, find the electric force. Part B, find the gravitational force. So this is going to be A, this is going to be B, and then part C, find the ratio. And we'll do Fe over Fg. So those are the three things that I want you to do. Find the electric force, the gravitational force, and I'll just draw you a little picture right here. We have an electron, we have a proton. They're separated by a distance. We always call the distance R. Even though it's R, you think radius, you don't have to divide it in two. I know that's a mistake some people have made in the past. You just use R. In this case, R is gonna be equal to that number right there, 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. And what I want you to do is, I want you to try to solve it, but don't put your answer in the box until I ask for it. Is that okay? Just solve it as much as you can. I'll give you like three minutes here. So 307, we're gonna come back and talk about this, but uh, solve it, don't put the answer in chat until I ask for it, okay? I'll give you three minutes. You will need the gravity. I'll let me write down the information for gravity.
Okay, that was like four minutes. Was it enough time, though? Let's see. If you have an answer for part A, can you put it in the chat? For the electric force? If nobody has an answer, I'm assuming there wasn't enough time. Hopefully some of you got an answer. It sounds like the right answer. The unit on yours, uh, Mendoza, is wrong. It should be in Newtons, right? Because we want a force, not Newtons per coulomb. Yeah. Okay, eight point two times ten to the negative eight. Okay, cool. Let's just do that. Let's do that calculation real quick. While I'll keep working on part B, if you haven't already done it. Um, okay, so electric force. All we have to do is plug in some numbers here. I'm just going to look at this. Okay, nine times ten to the nine. As annoying as it is, you got to write all this stuff out, especially on a, uh, especially on a test. Times Q1. Well, they have the same charge. One is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, and the other one's the same. So we basically just square this, and then we divide that by um, the distance between them, which is here, 5.3. And then don't forget to square this. You all are saying that you get 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. Is there anybody that disagrees with that? Anyone that got a different answer where like, they feel very strongly that they got the right answer? I'm just going to write that it's attractive over here because they are going to attract each other. Yeah, Haiti, when you, when you do the electric force, you're going to take the absolute value of the charges, okay? Take the absolute value of the charges. Just get rid of the, yeah, just get rid of the signs. Great, okay, let's look at uh, the next part. Isn't it one over K? No, it, the K's in the numerator. The one that's in the denominator is this one. One over four pi epsilon naught. Kavi, is that what you mean? No, the, the, K's, the K's right here in the numerator, yeah. Are you good? Okay, this is part A. Let's do part B. Force of gravity? And we, okay, so can you guys put, put an answer in the chat if you got an answer for the force of gravity? Should be much, much, much smaller. Now we're multiplying by masses. Now the masses are up here. So we got the mass of the proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. We're multiplying that times the mass of the electron, which is really tiny. It's 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. We're dividing all of that by the distance between them, which is again the same. And seeing some 3.6 times 10 to the negative 47. I don't think I can fit this over here or else it's gonna run into some things. So we'll just put it down here. Okay, everybody agree with that one? I just see three people have put that in there. So are we just gonna trust them or does it, it, people agree? Okay, good. It's about the right order of magnitude. One thing I can tell you in terms of like helping you to like think about these things does the negative sign of the electron rule down well you just you just use the absolute you see the absolute value signs on these symbols right here these are absolute value symbols right here and here you have to uh you know there's there's different ways you can do this by the way too you can think about it in the following sense like you could leave the charges in there right what would the sign of the suppose that you left the charges in here Right? You guys all said you got a negative number, right? Everybody agree? If you leave the sign in there, you're going to get a negative number, right? Because you're going to be doing negative 1.6 times, times positive. It'll be negative times positive, you get a negative number. So one thing you could do is you could just tell yourself, okay, when I get a negative number, it means it's attractive, right? This is the gravitational constant, Johnny. This is the universal gravitational constant. It describes the force of gravity in our universe. I put it in later. I forgot to write it down. My bad. Yeah. 
So, uh, what would happen if I put two negative charges in here? And I didn't, and I, 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 you know what I mean? I just put negative times a negative. I'll get a positive number, right? And if I have two positive charges, I'll get a positive number, right? This is assuming you don't use the absolute value signs. So one thing you could say is that if you get a negative number, it's attractive. If you get a positive number, it's repulsive. But it's probably easier in terms of not confusing you to say that you just you just put the absolute value signs on there, and then you have to write the direction of the force on the picture, right? Okay. So we've got Fe, we've got Fg. What did you all get when you took the uh, the ratio then? What's the ratio? So if we take um, Fe over Fg, yeah, it's about 10 to the 39, right? So about 2 times 10 to the 39. And the thing here, the 2 doesn't matter at all. But the 10 to the 39 is what matters. So that means at this distance, at this distance where the two objects are very, very close together, the ratio of the forces, and the distance wouldn't even matter, actually, I'm sorry, because we're taking a ratio, the distance would just cancel out. This is really just describing the overall strength of electricity versus gravity. So that means that in this particular scenario, involving a proton and an electron, that the force of electricity is 10 to the 39, almost 10 to the 40 times as powerful as the force of gravity. That is an almost inimaginable number, right? Yeah, electron strong, gravity weak, exactly. I mean, that, that tells you, I think, I hope, everything you need to know about the electric force. It's way more important than the gravitational force. How much more important? It's 10 to the 40 times more important. Almost, almost all of your experiences in your life, almost all of your sensations are governed by the electric force, okay? That's where your sense of taste, smell, that's why a magnet can stick on a fridge. Well, that's magnetism, Ton, but it's 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 the same concept, right? It's in the same it's in the same ballpark, right? Clearly, in that case, the the magnet strength is stronger than gravity, and in this case, the electric force strength is greater than the force of gravity. The electric force is very 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 strong, and it it dominates most of your experiences. You know, the force of friction comes from electricity. The normal force that we talk about in physics one a it comes from electricity. The real is just electric impulses interpreted by your brain. Yeah, pretty much, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very, very strong force. Gravity is unimaginably weak. In order to have a, a, a substantial force of gravity, what do you need? What do you need to have a big gravitational field? What's required? Big mass. Big mass, right? You need like a planet, a planet, something that's so big that it is incredibly hard for us to imagine. A planet that is so big that when we look at it, it looks flat, right? It, it's Our planet is so big that when we look at it, even though we know it's curved, most of us know it's curved, right? Uh, it looks flat. So in order to have a substantial force of gravity, you need to have an immense amount of mass. But to have a substantial amount of electric force, all you need to do is take a piece of plastic and just rub it with some fur. And all of a sudden, you can use that plastic to pick up little tiny pieces of paper that are held down only by a massive planet, right? You can lift up these tiny little pieces of paper that they have, they have a mass and they're in a gravitational field, but all it takes is just rubbing this thing a little bit and it can pick up all these little pieces of paper. But in order to hold them on the planet, to prevent them from flying off the planet, you need the entire planet. Otherwise they would just fly off, you know, because they're really light. So electricity is, uh, I mean, in terms of classical physics, it, it really is the most important force, you know? It's, it's the force that kind of binds everything together, right? It, it holds together atoms, it holds together molecules, right? Some of you probably learned a lot in your chemistry class about how a lot of the ways in which molecules bind to each other is through, like, like ionic bonds, right? Where you have, like, a positive sodium and a negative chlorine ion, and they, they bond together through this electric force. Well, you can imagine that the force between them is probably very, very strong, right? So, um, I don't know. Probably said too much about that. We need to take another break. Uh, the point is that, like, the, the main point of this problem is to give you an idea of how to do a simple calculation before we do something a little more complicated here. Hopefully you all were able to get this answer. If you weren't, go back and go into your calculator and make sure you can get this to work out. Um, using these, this scientific notation here can be pretty, it can be pretty hard to get comfortable with it, you know? In fact, let me show you something real quick, because now is a really good time to do this. I'm sure some of you didn't get the answer right, and by the way, that's totally okay. You know, we're, we're, when we do things like this in class, 
I'm, ne I'm never gonna give you enough time to where every single person in the class is gonna get the answer, but that's okay. The whole point of challenging you to do something on the fly like this is to just get your brain actively involved in doing stuff, you know? You're not gonna learn very much by just sitting there and listening to me. You might learn something, but you're not gonna learn much. You will learn a lot if you challenge yourself, right? To, uh, to do the things that I ask you to do, and, and then you're kind of actively involved in learning. I wanna show you how I would put this into a calculator. And I'm gonna show you this calculator from EE Web, but I just wanna say that your TIs work in exactly the same way that I'm about to show you, okay? So how would you write this into a calculator? This is how I would do it. I would write, so it's nine times 10 to the nine, right? I would click the nine. You guys can see the calculator okay, right? It's kind of blocked a little bit, but you can see it now. So what I would do is I would use this little key right here. What does this key do? Can you all tell me? What does this EE key do when I click that? What does that mean? When it puts the little E in there like that, what does it mean? Exponential. Time. It means times 10 to the, and then whatever you put next. So this whole thing right here means the same thing as basically that. That's nine. That's times 10 to the nine. But the, the advantage of this, okay, the, the power of this, I would say, is that this is a number just like 77 is a number, just like 34 is a number. 99 to this calculator is no different than like just a normal number, right, without scientific notation. So that means we don't need to put a bunch of parentheses around things. What we can do is we can just go on multiplying. So the next thing to type would be times. We would type 1.6, and then we would push this E again. Now, if you want to try this with me, if you have a TI of any kind, you're going to see a button like this somewhere on there. On like an 83, for example, it is above the comma key. You have to push second comma, I believe, to get to this button. On TI-30Xs, I think it's usually just a button on the, on the one of the main buttons you can just push, right? So different kinds of TIs, Casios, almost all calculators have something like this. Anyway, let's keep going. So 9E9, we're on 1.6E, I just put negative 19, I can just type negative 19 just like that. And again, if I wanna square this, do I need to put parentheses around it? No, I can just click squared. And it actually, it doesn't just square the 19, it's actually gonna square this whole number right here. All right, then we're gonna divide and we're gonna divide by this. So we have to divide by 5.3e, put negative 11, and we're gonna square it again. And notice that I haven't used a single parenthesis. Do I have restrictions on the type of TI we can use for exams? No, I don't. I don't think so. I haven't seen one yet. And as long as you don't bring a new TI in, it basically works like a laptop. If you bring in a laptop and tell me that it's a Texas Instruments calculator, I probably won't believe you. Anyway, push equals. I didn't mean to push that twice. Let's delete this one. Can I delete it? We'll go click up. Yeah, so I pushed equals and that's what I got. Exactly the same answer that everybody in here got, right? So if you haven't learned how to use this functionality of your calculator, I would say this class, this class in particular, you're really gonna wanna do it. Because I mean, look, this is the first problem we really did and, and there's there's already so many exponentials in it. And if we go back to the calculation we did earlier with the electron, again, there, there were exponentials in this one too, right? Six times 10 to the negative six divided by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So if you hadn't seen this before, do you all kind of see the power of being able to use that that button for calculating these and reducing the number of keystrokes and stuff like that? Because I mean, we're gonna be taking timed exams in this class. You've gotta get good at doing this stuff fast, right? So so this this will save you a lot of time. It'll also, it'll also make it less likely you make mistakes. Okay, I said a little too much there, but I, hopefully you've learned how to do that. If, if you can't figure that stuff out, then like the first time we meet in person, I can help you out. I'll show you on your calculator how to do it if you can't figure it out, I'm happy to do so. Okay, time to take another break. We are gonna break until uh, 10 minutes from now, so that's 3.32.